thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Andrew Hickman, and I've uh, just come back from uh, Indonesia visiting Kalimantan. Um, and I want to ask a question from some friends uh, that I w work with there. Um, I just wanted to preface that to say uh, that two themes seem, that seem to have come out today. Uh, one is the issue of corruption, and the other is the issue of building relationships. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to comment that I, I do work out there in Indonesia, uh, looking at Indonesia, and I know that you've talked about building relationships, for example, with China, um, the, the people that you export to. I, I hope you also consider the issue of building relationships with the producers and thinking about the communities and the workers that, that, that produce the material that, that makes this company so wealthy yes, and makes the shareholders wealthy. Um, my question is um, from the people there, from JATAM, which is the mining advocacy network in Kalimantan. Um, and I just wanted to first very quickly mention the development that happened this week on Tuesday. Um, the Attorney General's office announced that it has found enough evidence to substantiate corruption allegations in the divestment of shares in Caltim Prima Coal. Now this happened on Tuesday. Um, as you'll know, um, you, you don't need me to tell you about Caltim Prima Coal, it's one of the biggest coal mines in the world. Um, and the question that I've been asked to ask relates directly to this divestment process. Why is it that Rio Tinto sold its shares in the Caltim Prima for half the price that was being offered by the local Kalimantan government? And my second question, why did Rio Tinto effectively sell the, share, the shares to Bumi Resources, which is controlled by Abrizal Bakri, one of the richest men in Indonesia. Um, and just to give a little bit of context to Abrizal Bakri, this man is the second richest man in Indonesia. He controls a vast empire of mining and other op operations. And he uh, is also a government minister, or was a government minister, and is involved and has been accused of major tax evasion is currently undergoing corruption, nepotism, and business malpractice. And just finally, to give you an example of the business malpractice that he's involved in, um, one of his companies owns the Lapindo Mud Flow, which is a, uh, an operation that was drilling for I don't know what. And they struck mud, and the effective mud disaster that happened has now put 100,000 people, made 100,000 people homeless. This man then, in order to avoid his obligations to compensation, tried to sell that company for two dollars to an offshore company in order to avoid legal jurisdiction. So my questions to you relate to this process of dealing with Kelton Prima and dealing with these people. And in the context of the corruption that we've all been talking about today, um, I don't understand it. Maybe you can enlighten us a bit further about how corruption happens and how it's allowed to happen. Thank you very much. Can I begin by responding? I shall ask uh, Tom to try and give an answer to the specific question you raised. I just do want to respond to the question of corruption. I assure you that the ways of doing business in Rio Tinto is a, is a very, very high priority. This is not something I say off the platform to pretend. It's taken really, really seriously because in the long run it impacts on our corporate reputation and frankly, without the corporate reputation for the way in which we do business and for the way in which we interface and deal with local communities, for example, and for the way in which we manage our environmental obligations, we will not be in business. Uh, with regard to the references to corruption that you've made, I want to be quite clear, and I thought I was quite clear, that the four employees were accused of receiving bribes from a variety of I, um, a private steel mills in China who were trying to get hold of steel, which otherwise they clearly were struggling to get hold of. Uh, it, it, it was no, there was no suggestion at all that in any way the attentor was engaged in that corruption uh, accusation. So I want to just be absolutely clear on that. I have no doubt that in the attentor we take corruption very, very seriously. Tom, do you want to try and respond yeah, to thank, this? Thank you. I mean, just for the audience's purpose, we were 
uh, 50-50 joint venture with, uh, with, with British Petroleum on the Coal to Priva coal mine uh, until about, I think, 2002 or 2003. At that point, we were faced with Indi in Indonesianization requirements to sell a portion of it. And during the course of that, this was a national requirement, not a, not a Kalimantan local requirement. And during the course that we went through that national uh, process and going through the individual bids in accordance to that national process, you're not only looking at the amounts, but also the certainty, the liquidity, the ability of the person to actually conclude that transaction. And we and BP together ultimately concluded that was the best commercial transaction that took place. Now, since then, there have been um, tensions between the local Kalimantan government and the government of Jakarta. Um, I can't say I understand all of those tensions. I can't say I, I, I think that all of those tensions are something that we would be seen to be supporting. We are not in Kalimantan right now. We've, we basically are, have no interest there. But we, we, we undertook the divestments with BP in accordance with the Jakarta-based Indonesian rules on disposal and the commercial transactions that were required. That was not something that um, the governor, gover governor at the time of Kalimantan would have liked. He would have liked to see a different outcome. Uh, but this was the best commercial outcome for Rio Tinto. And it was completely compliant with all of our codes of conduct. And I, just, I understand completely compliant with our joint ventures code of conduct at the time. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, uh, just, just to add, thank you. Um, I, in the context of that, I mean, you didn't actually answer the, the, the question about this association with, with this man, Abrazel Bakri, uh, but maybe, maybe that is difficult to plot. I just wanted to say, in the context of Rio Tinto's continuing engagement with Indonesia, um, that, that you're continuing to develop these projects, for example, the, the nickel mine in, in Sulawesi. And um, it's all related, as far as I understand. Th these, these powerful elites um, have connections. And your answer doesn't help me understand why it is that you sold this company for such, a, for such a low price. And it leads me to think that maybe Rio Tinto is somehow complicit in the, the continuing uh, malpractice and, and, to put it bluntly, corruption that exists in Indonesia. And I, uh, I hope that you can give me a better answer next time. I, I short, short answer, absolutely not. We sold it for cash, and we haven't had any relationships with the individual since then. We are looking at every transaction on a case-by-case -case basis, and they are completely compliant with our codes of conduct and completely compliant with all of the global uh, rules and regulations around corruption, and, or, and if we can't make them client, we won't be there, period.